Hi, I'm Robert Wright. I run the Non-Zero Foundation, which produces all the shows on blogging Heads TV and Meaning of Life TV. We host a variety of voices, some of them pretty unorthodox, and we encourage dialogue that is sharp but civil. We think fostering constructive conversation is especially important now that America and the world are looking kind of fragile. If you agree that our mission is important, I hope you'll consider helping us shoulder the cost. You can do that by becoming one of our cherished patrons at patreon.com slash nonzero foundation. That's N-O-N-Z-E-R-O-F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N. Thanks. We need your help, and we deeply appreciate it. Hi, John. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Good. Good. Thanks Let me introduce this. Oh, my pleasure. I'm glad you could uh, take time out of your what I know is a is a is an actually busy schedule. You're a very productive person. Let me explain to people uh, in what sense. Uh, let me first say uh, that you're John Eikenberry. I'm Robert Wright. This is the Wright Show, available on both streaming video and audio podcast. Um, you are a, I would say, highly esteemed uh, scholar in international relations uh, and politics at Princeton University. And this is part of a series of conversations I'm doing with people from various parts of the ideological landscape about what kind of ideological vision should guide America's engagement with the world in the future. Um, I'm asking people to articulate and then defend uh, their their worldview, uh, their their kind of foreign policy vision. Now, your name, uh, as other scholars will know, and and as students of of uh, international relations will know, is is I would say pretty closely associated uh, with the term um, liberal internationalism, and also with a related thing called the liberal international order. Uh, in fact, I'd say you are generally considered more responsible than any other scholar for making that phrase a thing that's talked about it. You, you wrote a lot about it in the, uh, 90s, maybe the 80s. It kind of came into currency, uh, I'd say, in the new millennium. Um, and, uh, uh, as it largely as a result of your work, um, I mean, it came into currency in, in the popular, uh, kind of mind. Started seeing it in the New York Times and places like that. Um, so why don't we start out now? Liberal internationalism is a broad term. A lot of people identify with it, uh, and then would go on to specify that they they have a, their particular take on it. And I'm sure that uh, when you talk about your own ideology, you have your own take on it. But why don't we start with just the generic definition of liberal internationalism as you see it? What does the term mean? Yes. Thank you, Bob. Uh, yes. Well, it's a great question, and uh, I've just finished a book uh, on that topic, so I've tried to uh, pull back and say, what is liberal internationalism? What, what's the book going to be called, by the way? It's, it's, it's going to be called uh, A World Safe for Democracies, Liberal Internationalism and the Crises of Global Order. Okay. So it starts with what many people see as today's kind of crack in the liberal international order, which we'll talk about in a little bit and the crisis of liberal democracy. And then uh, it then asked, well, what precisely are the ideas that uh, have inspired this order that seems to be so troubled today? And so I uh, set, us out, set out on a, a really on a journey, a political and intellectual journey back over the last 250 years to try to reconstruct the liberal international tradition. And I will tell you that in doing that, I found it's, it's rich in vicissitudes. It's 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 a um, a field or a tradition that uh, famously sits alongside the other great tradition of international relations called political realism. But unlike political realism, it doesn't have quite the co- coherence intellectually and historically that is easy to grasp. Grasp, mm-hmm. although it can be reconstructed, and I think as I would want to defend today that there is such a tradition, that there are a set of ideas, that it has ideas, theories, narratives, lineages, classical te- texts, mm-hmm. great debates, uh, a sense that liberal internationalists across the 19th and the 20th century have kind of known that that's kind of what they're doing and that they are part of a tradition taking things before them, handing them 
on to people after them. Richard Cobden, the free trade uh, anti-corn law movement of the 19th century. John Hobson, the sort of anti-imperial uh, internationalisms of the turn of the century. And, of course, um, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, mm-hmm. in the context of World War I, FDR, uh, and uh, the post-World War II era, when we start to see something that might be called a liberal international order. Uh, and then on today, uh, Obama, uh, Clinton. Uh, so there's there's intellectually a lineage, and there's politically a project, and uh, there's a story to tell about about those ideas, which I can then say a bit more about. Okay. So before we say more about liberal internationalism or the liberal international order, the relationship between the two of them is extremely close, right? In other words, the liberal international order is the manifestation of the ideology liberal internationalism. I mean, right, if you're, if you're a liberal internationalist, you want some version of the liberal international order to prevail. That's right. The, what, uh, the converging vision of liberal internationalists would be an international order that's, as I say, open, loosely rule-based, and progressively oriented, those three things. So it has a sense of, of open, which means it's not a world uh, divided into spheres of influence, certainly not a world divided into empires. Um, it's a, so in that sense, open uh, in the sense of, uh, of, not, uh, of loosely rule-based. Uh, the, the conviction there, of course, is that uh, a cooperative organization of the international system uh, based on rules and institutions that serve primarily liberal democracies in the first instance, but the larger order. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the, the, a term that uh, is useful, I think, in this discussion, social purpose. That is to say, international orders of whatever kind can be seen as having some purpose, doing things, uh, expressing values, uh, solving problems, doing work of one kind or another. And liberal internationalists see the at least the ideal liberal international order as one that has social purposes associated with uh, strengthening uh, liberal democracy, the values we attach to these, these types of polities we call liberal democracies. One of the, and just to kind of finish this thought, one of the kind of moves of my new book is to bring liberal internationalism back to the rise and evolution of liberal democracies, the crises of liberal democracy itself over the the decades and centuries, and tie, uh, as I think it should be, uh, the international project of liberal internationalism to um, protecting, strengthening, uh, to use Wilson's term, to make the world safe for liberal democracy. Okay. So, um, let me ask a question. Um, I think, let me just say, uh, generally, of the two words, liberal internationalism, I think it's the second one that's perfectly straightforward. It is a view that America should be engaged in the world. It's it's internationalist. It's not isolationist. I think uh, the word liberal is uh, probably what needs more drilling down on. Now, when, before we get to that in an abstract way, let me let me ask you a kind of applied question. So imagine a world in which, okay, it's very rules-based – Everyone's, we have robust international law and norms and everyone's abiding by them. It's kind of diffusely multipolar, so it, it's not, there's not like two blocks or anything. It's open in your sense of the term. But let's imagine that one of the countries that is playing by the rules is, uh, a China that domestically, in terms of domestic politics, is what it is today. A pretty authoritarian country, not a democracy. Um, you would not, I assume you would say, not good enough. We don't have a liberal international order y- yet because we have, some of these countries aren't democracies. No. Is that, is that, that is right? I can, I can answer that in two ways. Number one, historically, the, the narrative of liberal internationalists is that the world in the old, old days, in the ancient and early modern period was de- defined primarily by, by empire. One, Part of the world was an anomaly. That was Europe, which didn't get consolidated, although from Charles V, Louis XIV, Napoleon I, and so forth, attempted to bring Europe into the world of empire, even as Europeans were pursuing quite successfully empire abroad. But there was something that became a kind of uh, 
multi-state system that we call the Westphalian system, which ultimately in the 20th century became a global system. And that's a type of internationalism. Let's call it uh, Westphalian internationalism. And it's based on uh, a sovereign equality principle, non-discrimination, uh, multilateral cooperation, but it doesn't have anything to do with regime type. You can be part of that without whether you're autocratic, liberal, illiberal, monarchical, what have you. Liberal internationalism in the 19th century was kind of bipolar and uh, agnostic ultimately about its ontology. Would it build its project of strengthening liberal democracy on empire or on the nation state? In the 19th century, it did both, and liberal internationalists uh, saw themselves, uh, even into the 20th century, as both defending liberal international values and uh, defending the British Empire. Uh, Robert Cecil, uh, uh, Wilson's counterpoint part uh, on the League, for example, and so forth. But what, uh, what, what liberal internationalists did was build their project ultimately on Westphalian internationalism. So liberal international order would be, could be seen as a more complex and cooperative order built on top of a system of intergovernmental Westphalian states, of which China and Russia would be part, but they, their, their relationship to the specifically club of liberal democracies or that uh, set of countries that, that have wanted to build an order on top of that Westphalian system with more liberal social purposes will be inside while others will still be operating internationally uh, on the outside. So that would be one way to, to answer your question. The other, very quickly, the other way is that, that and I didn't fully realize this until I, until I started writing more explicitly what is liberal internationalism and what is liberal international order, um, there are two meanings for liberal international order. One is the order itself is liberal. So it has liberal characteristics, right. open, transparent, right. rule of law, blah, blah, blah. But you could, but we, we also and use, a, use liberal international order in a second sense, and that is whatever the order is that supports a coalition of liberal democracies. Right. So take NATO or the alliances. Uh, if you are defending NATO and the alliances between the United States and its Asian partners, you may be seeing yourself defending the liberal order, although the features you're defending are not themselves liberal. Right. And that's what so I meant when I, ambiguity that, that's what that, I meant when I said drilling down, the word liberal was what needed drilling down on because it has that ambiguity. It seems to me it's a, a critical question is kind of which way you go on it. Um, because just take the current situation. There are people like, you know, Josh Hawley, conservative, uh, somewhat Trumpist, uh, senator wrote an op-ed for the New York Times not that long ago. Which seemed to me to amount to, to advocating a cold war with China. And as I recall, was envisioning, uh, a, a kind of a, a trade block, uh, consisting of countries like us, like liberal democracies, you know? And if, you know, at the other end of the, of the spectrum is the idea that, you know, what countries do with their own politics is their business. It's like my next door neighbor. I have no idea what's going on. I do demand that he not throw stuff in my backyard. He, he abide by the law and so on. Right. And, and there is a view of international politics that is like that. Um, certainly, uh, realists, of course, realists, since they've tended to be conservative, I'm not sure. It uh necessarily needs to stay that way but historically they've tended to be conservative haven't been as big on international law as liberals to begin with still to the extent that there were any international laws or norms they wanted abided by that's kind of all they were asking it's like don't attack me you know don't and and and, and behave yourself in terms of your external behavior i will not be judgmental about uh what you're doing internally josh holly uh, it seems to me is 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 uh, at another extreme, and and I guess I'm asking: Is it definitionally true of of liberal international order that it wants to be judgmental in this way? And and I guess you'd say the Westphalian system wasn't judgmental, right? It wasn't judgmental about the internal politics of neighboring right. states that so was, much. And something that's its brilliance: the Westphalian order, as somebody like uh, Henry Kissinger would argue, it, it's so simple. As long as you are you abide by some minimal. Uh, 
external set of principles, which is mutual recognition and, and right. uh, mu- coexistence and non-aggression. Uh, you, you can do what you want inside. And, and uh, liberals, uh, we, liberal internationalists are a, a rich and varied uh, group and it not just changes from the 19th century to the 20th century, but at any given time, there's been mm-hmm. you know, those, they, they varied uh, uh, in all sorts of different ways that we can discuss. And one way, of course, has been how universal is the project. So uh, I argue, and the very first uh, observation I make in my book is there is this phrase, making the world safe to, for democracy, uttered by by Wilson uh, in his war speech, bringing a declaration of war speech, is a declaration that he gave in front of Congress. And that phrase has been uh, coded as indicating that li- as the most important uh, single statement of liberal internationalism, that it means taking liberal democracy out into the world and spreading it, to bringing mm-hmm. the, the fruits of freedom and democracy to distant shores. But you can read that phrase in a different way as building an international order to make your liberal democracy safe, which is more of a conservative protective trying to Mm. do things that will allow for liberal democracy, which remember liberal democracies flow out of these various uh, deep uh, traditions that go all the way back uh, into the ancient era, uh, Athens for the demos, Rome for the Republican institutions. And there's always been, into the 19th century, a sense that a vulnerability that republics are are fragile, like a uh, like a like a, like a, like a, a tulip or or, or 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 so so forth, and and so you need to have a kind of environment around these republics to make them safe and not lead them to uh, uh, be put into crisis and uh, geopolitical competition uh, uh, undercuts constitutional limited state government and all the rest. So there is a sense of liberal democracies having an international uh, uh, project, building a, an order, but it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be global. Mm-hmm. But it is there, but there's the fun, the, the, the bare minimum is a sense that liberal democracies need each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you like rafts in a, in the, the, the churning seas of modernity, uh, liberal democracies need to tie themselves together in some sense, because mm-hmm. alone, as Benjamin Franklin said to the, 13 colony leaders on July 4th, 1776, we, uh, we will either hang together or we will surely hang separately. There's a sense of, of, of that vulnerability. I'm trying to bring that back. This isn't the post-1989 uh, sense that liberal democracies are on the march and everybody get out of the way. It's a sense of you can lose it. There have been extinction moments and that mm-hmm. you need to have an international order to help protect you. And uh, again, uh, that bare minimum is what I would defend. There are those who would go further and say you have to uh, think that the, the sheer kind of underlying principles, and this would be the critique of John Mearsheimer on, uh, on the realist side, that yes, liberal democracies uh, have at their birth a set of principles that, that, that escape the, national, the nation state system, the preamble of the declaration, all men are created equal. Um, uh, Jefferson, uh, uh, Lincoln's second founding at Gettysburg. Uh, that these are kind of it's a project for all mankind. Uh, the, the U.S. as the first new nation. Uh, that it was this kind of enlightenment, uh, a, a liberal modernity notion of what liberal democracies w- were, and there, there. So there's a kind of implicit universalism in there, and there's a mm-hmm. history that suggests that it has those kind of laws of motion. But again, there is a, a liberal demo, liberal internationalists do not agree on how interventionist sh- it should be, for example, but also how global right. it should be. So you can have liberal internationalists say, we, uh, in the face of illiberal states, coexistence. Uh, others say, uh, we'll try to bring them in, and they aren't fully liberal yet, but we're going to socialize them. That was mm-hmm. the Western grand strategy after the Cold War. Um, others would say you've uh, you've got to uh, stand up to them and uh, put pressure on them. Mm-hmm. How do you respond to the what's going on in Hong Kong, for example? Mm-hmm. Uh, 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 so there, there's you know there's not nothing. I I, I don't adopt a, a no true Scotsman kind of view that 
you have to have this belief to be inside of the camp. Mm-hmm. There, there are, it's, there's an ongoing debate. It's an unfinished and always will be an unfinished debate. What are the components and how universal should it be? Uh, and it's, again, across 250 years, you see all varieties of it. Let me ask, uh, I assume there have been people who suggest that if we look at these two different sides of the word liberal, in other words, on the one hand, the description of the overall international order you're trying to construct, it's liberal, it's open, uh, come one, come all, you know, it's it's in- inclusive. Uh, I mean, tell me if I'm going too far, but it seems like it has these connotations. And then the other meaning of liberal has to do with uh, fostering liberal democracy within individual nations, I assume people have pointed out that potentially there is a tension between those two goals, right? Because if your order is going to be open, then you would think you can't be too judgmental about whether a nation that wants to join it and play by the rules is a liberal democracy. Uh, and well, if you do get very judgmental and start hectoring them about their system or or going further and like invading, as we've been known to do... Um, then you know that 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 uh, right. that's then it's not a liberal international order right. if you, it, right or or if you flat out exclude people. I mean, there for example, there's this idea of a league of democracies that uh, has floated around. I think at one time or another you seemed supportive. I don't know what your current view is, but that is an exclusive system. Okay, I, I first of all on your your underlying point about. Uh, tensions and debates, uh, uh, the kind of the, the underlying, the term liberal has these different meanings. Yes, and indeed, that's the point in some sense, that liberal societies are inherently, for better or worse, built on te- values and principles that are in tension with each other. Liber- uh, equality and liberty and equality. It, it, you can't have, you can't max out on both of those. Uh, individualism and social solidarity, sovereignty and interdependence. In some sense, to, to be a liberal and to defend liberal societies or liberal democratic societies is to be permanently facing problems of balancing and trade-offs mm-hmm. and try to figure out how you can do as much good as you can given those conflicts. And so too internationally, I think the, the liberal internationalists are heir to that same set of a cluster of conflicting values. Mm-hmm. Now, um, people, individual liberal internationalists uh, are, are inconsistent. Uh, I look closely at, at Wilson. In the run-up to American participation in World War I, for example, the very first important speech that Wilson gave uh, in 1916 to the League uh, to enforce the peace, where he makes his first public statement of support for something called the League, and for the and importantly, um, apologizes for some of America's interventionism of earlier periods, he uh, sketches the idea of of an international organization that would be universal membership. And it was only after he brought the U.S. into World War I and had had this this more specific, he had this more specific vision of, of the League of Nations where to be in it, you had to be a liberal democracy. And that was Wilson 2.0, and then after the war at Versailles, it was 3.0, and he was back to the original position that it, it will be, and each has its, it, it, there's a theory behind both exclusive and open system versions. Open system is, well, the problems are global. For example, global warming is not mm-hmm. just a liberal democracy problem, mm-hmm. terrorism, blah, blah, blah. And then, the, but there are very specific problems, human rights, Specific issues of political economy, of industrial societies, um, uh, envir- certain kinds of social purposes that are really only going to be generated in a smaller unit, a, a smaller coalition of like-minded states. Mm-hmm. And so I think I end my book arguing you've got to do both, but that if you really want to save high-order liberal societies where we take care of our workers, where we have a social welfare state, where we have a high order functioning society, you, you've got to do that in a club-like 
coalition of states that share those social purposes. Because if you leave everything to a world where the only international agreements are ones where you can that you can sustain between uh, Sweden and China, you're going to have such a degraded degraded system that you're not going to be able to to maintain your way of life. So, well, what what would you makes, want to do? Sense? Does well, that I, I guess I'd like uh, illustration of of um, what kinds of relationships among this smaller group of nations you want to see. In other words, the the, the kinds of uh, the bonds uh, that cannot bind Sweden and China. Whatever mm-hmm. the what are, what are the, the the bonds or rules or norms that cannot exist between Sweden and China but really need to exist between us and some nations more like us. What's a concrete example? What's just one thing? Yeah. Are you the, saying trade should be restricted to democracy? Trade not should trade, be... But, but certain kinds of labor agreements uh, would, would only be possible between uh, uh, social democratic states, um, it, certain environmental protections bought, uh, brought into investment agreements... I'm, um, are you sure about that? Are you uh, sure? Right now, we are, we are, aren't we, isn't the United States at least as big a problem uh, for global, in terms of joining an actual global regime to do something about glo- global warming? Aren't we at least as big a problem as China in terms of our willingness to even sit down at the table? Exactly. No, we are, we and are. We're a democracy. So why but, are you but saying the, but the answer that, is not, it's not to let everybody, uh, go to kind of race to the bottom, which and Trump is in some sense doing, but, but uh, uh, redouble your liberal internationalism around well, uh, uh, intensive agreements on... Sure, uh, sure. In terms yeah. of the order, you want a rule-based order. Uh, but but, but I, I was taking you to say there are cases where kind of you can need to you need to stick with your fellow liberal democracies and I took you to be citing environmentalism as an example and I don't think that's a good one because we are as much of an outlaw a nation right now in terms of climate change at least as much as China. It's far from clear to me that you couldn't get China uh, to, to be a productive player there sooner than you could get us, given our politics. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. I, 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 you have a more optimistic view of what China... I mean, I, I, China is, it, 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 it is in the Paris Agreement with uh, all the in, imperfections there. The United States is not. So I take your right. point. But I, I, and I do think a lot of uh, climate change is global. So I'm not arguing that we should uh, draw the drop the drawbridges and uh, and only organize the world around liberal democracies but there but there as i said i think on various issues uh, do you want to if if you um, give up on I mean, take take the european union as kind of an example of where, where i'm going with this uh, could you really have a european union with uh, um, and maybe we'll find out uh, with with countries to the east like Hungary, but but there is a sense of of, of conditionality. If you are going to be inside this grouping, you are going to uh, buy into a suite of, of of rights and responsibilities and values that, uh, in the absence of which, we will not be able to sustain sustain uh, the social purposes we attach to to the European Union. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Mutual aid, uh, assistance, uh, addressing questions of human rights and and standards for all sorts of different things. Much of it very prosaic and and not terribly sexy, but it is a kind of building the kind of world that uh, and societies uh, that you want to live in. And I, I think that is a double task of, of of solving global problems at the global level, but also. Um, I, I think part of the reason why liberal the, the liberal international order is in trouble today is that it 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 lost its kind of functioning as a as an association a kind of confederation of states that had similar purposes and it became global and uh, as I suggest in the book it's a little bit like the 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 club of democracies which is tied around alliances and trade agreements and so forth and came out of the 1940s 1945 post war order um, that club like character was very functional it it ushered in a, a golden era which i'm happy to talk about into the 70s and 80s but what happened was that club became in the 1990s and afterwards when everything was in some sense 
the world that you are suggesting we, we need to move to was in fact attempted and it became not a club but more like a, a shopping mall where the liberal order is open to everybody. You can come in and you can join this or you can join that. Uh, you can go to Gap and you can go to Apple, but you don't have to go to Macy's. In other words, it's a kind of um, ad hoc, um, uh, uh, take your choice kind of participation. And that led to the predicament we're in now and that nobody really is stepping up to defend and uh, uh, lead um, a grouping of states that has some set of social that, social purposes that we that we want to try to protect. So we're in this kind of it's just a kind of a Westphalian or this is where we're headed uh, a Westphalian system where everybody's invited and you can do as much as you want, but if it gets costly, you can go home. Well, I think those are two different things. I, I mean, we may be that may be the system. But the question of whether you're Westphalian in the sense of not judging people's internal politics and letting them be part of the international club, whether they're authoritarian or democracy, that's separate from the question of whether you're really expected to obey the rules. I mean, it, 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 yeah. I mean, you're saying we're, we're headed for what you might call the worst of both worlds, not very judgmental and nobody's playing by the rules. I agree that's bad. Uh, we want and people the, to play the, by my, the rules. The, what brings those two points together, what, they are separate points, what brings them together is that I'm not convinced that anybody, uh, any hegemonic state is willing to, to, to engage in the kind of leadership to make sure that you have a cooperative order with rules that are enforced Right. If it's just kind of lowest common denominator, that you you step up when you see yourselves as part of something that you're trying to defend, and quite frankly, that often has been historically. I, we can un, we can kind of reverse engineer this historical observation to see what the theory is. But the historical observation is that liberal democracies, domestically and internationally, have performed at their highest level when there are system competitors. Uh, out there that threaten their way of life. It sharpens what's at stake. It makes countries do things they might not other be, otherwise be willing to do. So I, I, yeah. I, as you can see, I'm headed towards uh, defending a liberal international order that's not global. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to get into my own form of sermonizing, but I would say there's, a, there's a, a, a reply some people would make is that actually during the Cold War, uh, America, in many ways, sold out its own principles. Fear of communism was so pronounced that J. Edgar Hoover tried to get Martin Luther King to commit suicide. Um, and I could go, and, and we supported death squads in Central America and so on. So I, the idea that uh, let me, I, let me, I want to I want to respond directly to that because okay. that uh, first of all, yes, the Cold War and bipolarity. Uh, created a systemic dynamics that realists talk about. And there's a lot of realist behavior that's not liberal and was not uh, uh, even legitimated really by liberal principles, let alone animated by them. Uh, but during that same cold war period, you had uh, re Republicans signing up to the uh, starting with Eisenhower uh, signing up to the new deal. You had uh, Tr Truman uh, disaggregate, uh, dis um, uh, uh, to open up the the armed forces and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, make it multiracial and open. You had uh, uh, social welfare and the great society and voting rights, and you did have a kind of the world is watching. And you had FD, you know, JFK in Geneva uh, uh, realizing that when there are race riots at home and you're trying to defend uh, the American model against the Soviet model, it helps if. At home, things are happening that look progressive, yeah. and and indeed there there's been, there's a very interesting scholarship that looks at looks at those feedback effects yeah. on liberal society from Cold War competition. It's a mixed yeah. bag, yeah. but uh, well, you also had the, the the unifying effect of existential fear, you know, uh, which is the idea that the Soviet Union could could nuke us or something had a unifying effect on the country and submerged partisanship and so on. There there were good things and bad things, and I'm in. In many ways, nostalgic about the America of my youth. Let's let's um, back up a little and talk a little ab more abstractly about the liberal international order. I mean, I think we are now. The conversation is moving into your uh, your own 
variant of liberal internationalism that you'd like to defend, and that's good because that's where I want to go. But let's make sure we uh, understand what we mean by liberal international order. I take it to mean, um, I mean, as we've said, a, a liberal internationalist imagines an international arena governed by laws and norms. And uh, we saw in the wake of World War II the development of a number of international institutions which mediated uh, laws and sometimes norms, certainly the United Nations. Uh, there was also the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank. Th- there was, uh, and, and there were, um, you know, international law developed to some extent. We could talk about to what extent various nations, including the United States, always complied with it, but... Anyway, is this, are we talking with, with the liberal international order? Are we talking about both a, you know, a set of institutions that mediate laws and norms and just a kind of a practice of taking all that seriously? Like there's things we're expected to do. Uh, some things that Trump has done, you weren't expected to do, you know? Yeah. Um, is, is that, what, what would you add, what would you yeah. subtract or add? To, from or yeah. add to that. Well, uh, let's start by I, one of the one of the moves I make in in my rendering of liberal internationalism is to try to decenter it from Woodrow Wilson. And I, as I will say in a minute, uh, I think FDR the 30s and 40s were the most creative time for the liberal project generally and for liberal internationalism. Um, and the what I call Rooseveltian internationalism, and distinguished from uh, Wilsonian internationalism. So I'm looking at different types. T- types of internationalism within this broader family. And then, of course, you go on from Rooseveltian internationalism, which has a great deal to do with um, with the, 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 the vision of international order that came out of World War II. You have the emergence after he's gone, and the Cold War really does uh, rear up uh, what, we, what I call liberal hegemony, which is really uh, uh, giving w- some of the older liberal internationalist ideas uh, tied to racial hierarchy and to civilizational concepts that uh, that uh, entangled liberals in the 19th century gave way to new entanglements, and the new entanglements were really entangling American power and the American system in different ways to the support of the liberal order. What, so one of the messages I would have is that um, uh, w- when we kind of try to think about liberal international order and its future, we, we it's useful to, to try to think about how uh, some of those principles and, and rationales for cooperation could be separated from America. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, think about uh, liberal internationalism in Europe, where it's really a European, not an Atlantic or a world system. It's really a European system. You've got liberal international principles there, but you don't have America directly. Mm-hmm. So, uh, in the so the, the the underlying principles or the underlying ideas are, are you can think of it as a series of convictions. One is going back to what we said: uh, a conviction of openness and trade is mutual. There are mutual gains to be had, and that progressive development of modern societies is tied to uh, interdependence of some some form or another. Mm-hmm. Secondly, a, and by the second, way, I should have mentioned the, at first the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade and the World Trade Organization, which evolved out of that, because that's, in yeah. a certain sense, more fundamental than the IMF and the World Bank. It, it, you know, if you view that the, the, the kind of the fundamental sinews in some respects as being right. economic interdependence. Right. But go ahead. And the, and the second conviction is about institutions, and uh, that that really emerges from the end of the 19th century, the uh, uh, the, the Hague conferences uh, of 1898 and, and 1907, and of course, the League era. The League, uh, the U.S. didn't join the League. The League didn't stop uh, Italy and Japan from going to war, but it, it, it created a kind of body of ideas about the permanent institutionalization of cooperation among major states and the rest mm-hmm. of the world as well. And then after World War II, there was a huge explosion, global, regional, economic, political, security, uh, uh, big institutions, the UN on down, some of them exclusive, some of them universal, some of them any sovereign state could join, some of them you have to be a democracy or you have to be in Europe or you have to uh, you have more, more conditional. Um, so, uh, Ex- openness and trade, 
institutions, cooperation. Thirdly, a third conviction is that democracies are different, and that they have special values they want to preserve, and they have special capacities to cooperate. Um, Trump is putting that conviction to the test, but yeah. but there is you have to say generally speaking there has been there have been more progressive um, uh, advanced uh, societies and cooperative cooperation between societies among democracies. It's there's something that's that that's that's added when these countries are of that sort. Whether it's transparency, the ability to have civil society. Uh, um, uh, you know, John Locke said that there's a there's there's a there's a conviction that if your society is based on the rule of law, you're more likely to respect other countries that also are based on the rule of mm-hmm. law. Um, uh, um, uh, um, okay, but John, yeah. John Rawls makes that a centerpiece of his liberal theory. And then the fourth uh, conviction is that in an age of rising economic and security interdependence, uh, you can't be secure alone. You can only be secure together. Now, again, the first, the second, and the fourth of those convictions are potentially Westphalian in their consequence. The third conviction is more about liberal democracy, but interdependence uh, uh, does lead to cooperation that doesn't simply involve liberal democracies. Uh, trade can be good among, among different kinds of states, institutions as well. But uh, So it is a mix. Uh, and those ideas are ideas that have come through the 19th century. In the 19th century, it wasn't really a liberal international order. Building was not a full-blown project that really you have to wait to 1919 to get that. It's really a t- types of internationalism, um, the peace movement, the free trade movement coming out of the corn laws, uh, jurists promoting international law, the arbitration movement, uh, um, uh, and then functional cooperation in the 19th century. And these different internationalisms get woven together after World War I. Then they get broken apart, and then they get woven together after World War II. Some internationalisms are not liberal. Uh, uh, some coming out of, you know, the Marx and the, the first and second international, fascist internationalism, uh, authoritarian internationalism of various sorts. You see some of that today in Eastern Europe tied to, to Putinism. So internationalisms uh, populating the modern world, many of them uh, clustered as kind of liberal-like, getting tied together, then frayed and retied together. Some of them are on the edges. Is neoconservatism uh, a, a type of liberal internationalism? Good, Is good question. I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was actually going to ask you that question. There are neoconservatives who would say, that they are liberal internationalists, probably, right? They'd say they're just trying to spread democracy the way Wilson did. Sometimes you got to play tough. You got to apply economic sanctions on authoritarian countries. Sometimes you have to invade them uh, and on and on, right? I, that- I do think neoconservatism on one side, neoliberalism on the other, they in various ways are tied to the cluster, uh, but uh, but debated, and so neoconservatism. Uh, Irving Kristol uh, called it a persuasion. So in that sense, it's not a theory or a doctrine. It's a kind of set of attitudes. It's a uh, uh, you take neoconservatives of the the Iraq War generation and you reverse engineer what they're saying. There, it is a it's kind of a powerful states. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, uh, I'm thinking of different neoconservatives who have different positions on Name this. Name names. But, Go ahead. Uh, 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 um, uh, you sound like you don't want to. Uh, Bob Kagan, Bill Kristol. Uh, there's a kind of powerful state that you know their 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 he- heroes are Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe um, uh, FDR, but but uh, but uh, Reagan for sure. And it's kind of powerful states. Uh, uh, starting with the United States, a kind of exceptionalism. Uh, you you go up, you, you you defend democracy. You try to spread democracy, but you don't really uh, put much attention uh, to building the international society to support um, the broader life of of of, of the mm-hmm. system. You it, you don't spend a lot of time defending international institutions or or uh, uh, or the kind of 
history of cooperation between democracies. It's kind of <laughs> much more unilateralist. Um, right. Uh, uh, well, uh, which brings us yeah. it brings us to the, to uh, a question I was going to raise about your belief that liberal democracy, something about liberal democracy that, that tends to make a nation more conducive to playing by the rules. I mean, there's two kinds of counterexamples uh, people give. I mean, first of all, there's there are sets of rules that most of the world seems happy to sign on to that America doesn't right now. You mentioned the Paris Accords. There's also the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, which doesn't seem to me all that radical a doctrine. You might expect a, fu- a functioning nation to, to ratify that, but we seem incapable of it. And then there are the cases where we have signed on to the rules, but we keep breaking them. So we, we were, you know, the, the UN, uh, charter, we signed on to. The invasion of Iraq by almost anyone's lights, I think, was a violation of the law set down and embodied in the United Nations. Even the Kosovo intervention, I would say, violated international law. The second half of the Libya intervention, I would say a lot of people would say that, yes, we did get the Security Council to uh, support the the intervention to protect uh, civilian populations, but then we exceeded that and went for regime change. I think, uh, and this is something surely you must have heard, is that all the... The moaning you hear from the foreign policy establishment about the demise of the liberal international order, which so often comes from people who supported individual initiatives that violate the laws and right. norms that supposedly constitute the order. Yeah, so- I, absolutely. I mean, I I'm I feel your pain, and I feel the same way. <laughs> I I I my, when you were making your your very passionate statement, I was thinking. Thank goodness we live in a liberal democracy so that we can sit here and talk about how uh, how underperforming our, our liberal democracies are. I mean, there is a sense of that's that is, part that of, is some consolation, but I don't think that helps you in your claim that liberal democracies are more likely to abide by the liberal international order, whereas the counter examples I just provided do challenge your claim. Right. Well, uh, they do challenge the claim uh, there. I, I would say. I think it would be hard to challenge the claim that uh, in the post-war era, leave aside the current moment where the U.S. is in, in some sense attacking that order, and we have the powers of the presidency uh, 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 in the hands of, of an individual who does not believe in liberal internationalism and who would, uh, I, I think, if, if, if would honestly say, uh, uh, wants to try to take take it down in one way or another. The WTO, the alliances, certainly uh, D- D- WHO, and all the, all the institutions you've been suggesting. I'm, uh, first of all, those institutions uh, you're suggesting should be supported, and you are ruining the fact that certain liberal democracies, starting with the United States, are not supporting them. And, and, I'm, emphasizing, the and I'm emphasizing that this started long before Trump. That's it my did. main point. Yeah, yeah, we, it's, yeah. I, I don't. When were we good actor? When were I, we? I, I, but, but I just this, this is this may not console you. But if you were trying to identify the ideas and political movements that have brought the world closer to that order that you are regretful is not more complete, and that liberal democracies are not standing up to participate in fully, it would be. Liberal, liberal America, liberal the liberal project from the 19th century and 20th century, as it has struggled to try to build that kind of world. So yes, you can. Your your point is well taken, but it doesn't. Where, where does it leave you? It leaves you with how do I? At least after the conversation is over, it's how do I? Uh, how do I make the case for a world where we have cooperation, multilateral cooperation on? on gr- the great issues of the day. And uh, well, I, the I, point I, is that who has been making those case, that case over the last 200 years? It's been liberals and liberal internationalists. And it's gotten China into the game to some extent, not completely, but it is the, uh, how do you deal with the problem you've identified? And for me, you deal with it by Going back to basics and say, what are the ideas? Okay. Why are they valuable? Why should we be doing more and rather than less? Why should we be in the W, 
uh, HO. Why should we be standing up when, uh, uh, in the face of, of China that in a Chinese world dominated by China, it's going to tilt away from values that you, uh, Bob, care deeply about? So you, you have to be on this team. And uh, <laughs> wait, wait a second. <laughs> you can't simply say, let's just let everybody, as long as they don't, don't attack each other, let's, let's let everybody do their own thing. I, I think that it's, it's, no, I, it's I'm, way, I'm, way beyond that at this point. I'm posing an empirical challenge to mm. something you said, okay? This, this starts out as a difference between you and me about how kind of judgmental you should be about other nations. In other words, and, and let me tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, I th- you know, you, 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 you said earlier that, well, there are some agreements that need to be global. I mean, climate change is a global problem and so on. Some less so. Uh, my own view is that the truly, you know, th- there are a number of truly existential threats to the planet. Not just environmental threats, but, uh, getting arms control uh, agreements as they pertain to weapons in space, bioweapons, cyber weapons, and the whole business of, of, of preventing some kind of arms race in human genetic engineering, right? There are all kinds of things where we really, I think, need agreement and pandemics, of course. Um, we need agreement among, uh, nations as an existential matter. For the whole planet. So I do, first of all, I have this bias toward inclusion in, yeah. in terms okay, of like, in terms of the nations, uh, that you want to participate in the too. rules I, system. I, I'm with you. I, I well, don't you think are, but you no, no, are, no, no. But let me, let me explain why I, I, I think, uh, well, I mean, you can read, read the book and see where the book ends. And, and the, the very last paragraph says we need to do both. We need to both strengthen the, bulwark uh, that allows liberal democracies to to uh, protect their values their interests and and to and to work as a coalition to make sure that the global rules that we all think are needed you've just made a case for them uh reflect our values and that we have we 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 work as we work together uh, uh think about the world as a big parliament and the the liberal democracies as the progressive party uh, we, we need to have that party functioning at the global level to make sure that that legislation we all want on global warming, on, on health, public health, on cyber, on uh, ge- uh, genetic engineering, uh, uh, both is there rather than not there, but also comports with our values. So uh, it's not that we need to exclude everybody else, but yes, we need a global parliament, but we need liberal democracies to be uh, aggregating and leveraging their their power, seventy percent of the world still lives in countries that are nominally democratic. But uh, but let me. I, okay, I but but I, I do want to drill down. Don't lose your your train of thought. But I just want to be clear about where I was I was heading when I said I'm trying to to pose an empirical challenge to something you said. You're right. You more than I emphasize. Uh, the need to, in some cases, be quote judgmental, and as in terms of your criteria for inclusion, you think there are a number of things you really want to get together and do just with liberal democracies or more with liberal democracies. And one of the grounds reasons you gave is that liberal democracies are better at playing by the international rules. And I am suggesting are better that, at that cooperating. Uh- but better that, that liberal democ- that, that in a world if we were to do the the grand counterfactual of a world in the 20th century without liberal democracy i my counterfactual would be we would have had far less uh, uh um, and with the power the leading states of that system being liberal democratic made the difference and it made the difference in the the amount of cooperation that was generated just just follow with me Leave aside Trump, leave aside what you see as retrograde behavior by democracies even before Trump, but think about the big accomplishments of the liberal international project in the second half of the 20th century. Opening up the world economy after the worst depression in history, creating institutions that 
led to trade agreements and tariff reductions that that uh, that created and uh, the, the the greatest golden era of economic growth in world history. Mm-hmm. Secondly, a framework was created by the liberal democratic a coalition to reintegrate Germany and Japan as liberal democracies into that order as non-nuclear states with pi- pioneering uh, new identities as civilian great powers. Thirdly, Germany and Japan for 70 years uh, had, had uh, Ger- excuse me, Germany and France three times in 70 years had gone to war with each other. They were mm-hmm. now in the shadow of this liberal project, finding a way to secure themselves through integration and binding rather than balancing and war. Uh, fourthly, Europe, it's, uh, Europe as a broader aggregate em- embarked on a, a project of, of creating a more perfect union. Fifthly, the liberal democracy, think about, read. It read was all history. very skillfully think, done. Think My hat's so. off to the greatest generation. I'm, I'm just saying. Well, it, it, into our period, it, it's, it's an ongoing, never-ending project. It wasn't a one-shot deal. Really? Creating those institutions, the trilateral, the G7, the trilateral world. Here, I'll give you a counterfactual. Suppose the U.S. had not violated international law by invading Iraq. Suppose the U.S. and our allies had not uh, flooded Syria with weapons in, an, in a failed attempt um, at regime change. Uh, suppose we had not generated chaos in Libya, which further unleashed uh, weapons uh, throughout the region, I would say you can make a good case that that uh, certainly there would not have been a huge uh, refugee exodus into Europe, uh, so Brexit, Brexit might not have passed, ISIS might not, uh, m- probably wouldn't exist, Trump wouldn't be president. These these are these were these were like American initiatives. I mean, okay. how far back I, I, how far I, I, back do we have to go before yeah. I can get nostalgic? Yeah. No, these I, things, I, the, you know, and 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 again, it goes back into the Clinton era. The 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 indifference to complying with international law in terms of the use of military force goes back to Clinton and back further and back further and back further. And so, no, absolutely, I, I, you you can't. I, you, I don't think you can. Uh, liberal democratic states have done lots of different things not all of them liberal democratic in nature that no liberal state has ever exclusively pursued international relations according to liberal principles there's a lot you were making uh, in our discussion of the cold war uh, i think we were agreeing that there was a lot of violence and intervention that was not either generated by liberal principles or or the liberal order, but was simply realists can explain it as balance of power geopolitics. And indeed, uh, into the uh, post Cold War era, uh, there's liberal democracies have certainly, uh, and the U.S. at the at the lead has certainly done crazy things, self destructive things, unilateral things, uh, failed to live up to the. The, the, the rhetoric uh, the, to the promise, uh, all of that is true. But all of that leads to the critique that they should have been more liberal internationalists, not less. And and for me, that means, okay, that's I spent my career trying to make that argument. Uh, I was doing that when the Iraq war was unfolding. Remember my piece in Foreign Affairs, the, ne- the neo-imperial temptation. Um, it wasn't just restraint realists so were you on record being you have more against sympathy you? to the restraint realists than i do but it wasn't just them uh who were cautioning restraint and and, uh, were and you, liberals were on both sides of the iraq war but did you write did you write against the invasion before the invasion in in the fall of of of, of 2002 god bless you in the in the fall and i i try to remind my realist uh, friends that they were not the only ones warning and there, yeah. there was a liberal critique of it. Remember, I was um, making arguments, uh, you know, arguing with John Bolton about unilateralism and Krauthammer and all that crowd. So uh, yeah. I, I, I don't disagree with your, um, your disappointment in the, the performance of liberal states. I'm just saying that in the longer flow of history, it's it's it outclasses every other kind of state. Number one, and secondly, well, uh, uh, again, I'm, again, I I I I'd like to see more evidence that it outclasses every other kind of state recently in terms of compliance. 
with the laws and norms against aggression. For, for example, we, we, we demonize the Iranian regime a lot. They've never invaded a country. Right. Almost all of the uh, aggression they are involved in. I mean, you compare them to Saudi Arabia or Israel. And I I see them as doing a lot less in the way of uh, violating international law. Yeah, they had troops in Syria at the invitation of the Syrian government. I mean, they they, they don't. Uh, Israel kills Iranians all the time, crosses borders to kill Iranians all the time. Iran never does that. With, with Israel, and 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 so who is breaking the rules? Or when the when the U.S. Uh, uh, joins with Israel to um, to launch uh, you know the cyber attack that actually blows stuff up in Iran, who's breaking the rules? Mm-hmm. And and Absolutely. and I, I just I, it's important. I'm not just who's whining de- who's about our history. The I'm, idea of rules. Okay, but 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 you seem to believe. That there cannot be a robust rules-based order that doesn't uh, exclusively involve liberal democracies, and I'm just saying it isn't clear to me that liberal democracies are so great at following the rules. Uh, for, uh, I, 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 I'll concede this, the second point that there is that liberal democracies do not always follow the rules, and and many of those. Uh, violations are egregious. Uh, I, 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 but I'm not arguing that a that a world that all that 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 only democracies can uh, operate in a, and build a world world of laws and rules. Uh, I, I I think we had a pretty long discussion of the Westphalian model mm-hmm. on which liberal democracies have built. Uh, and we need both. Yeah. We need all the states in the system operating as success, as cooperatively as possible on these big global problems of modernity. I, I'm with you there. I, I think that argument for uh, political cooperation on a global scale has been most eloquently made over the last 200 years by liberals. So... Uh, my, my so hats you, off. You, so, 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 it, it's it, I, I, so, and then secondly, uh, so that's number one. Secondly, I to kind of summarize where where I think I'm at on our conversation. Um, I I am defending the proposition that liberal democracies historically have built more cooperative, progressive. Uh, realms of order than any other kind of state in world history. And that's just simply true. Uh, even as they have behaved uh, um, mm-hmm. in egregious ways, uh, intervening, violating, overturning, uh, as you suggested. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me, maybe, I mean, uh, as I said, I do want to flesh out uh, more your particular Variant of liberal internationalism. As you said, there's, there's a, a kind of a Westphalian model is, is consistent with a version of it. Uh, and then there's also a League of Democracies is consistent with a version of it. Uh, to, to, why don't we take a specific example? And let me just ask you, what should our policy toward China be right now? There's a lot of argument about this. As I said, on the one hand, there's, okay, it's time to, to disengage economically and even make that part of a broader movement toward a uh, kind of tightened economic agra- uh, integration among liberal democracies, right? There's that, that kind of a Josh Hawley thing. Um, uh, but there are people who want to definitely remain engaged. There are people who want to um, try hard to change the situation in Hong Kong or the situation with the Uyghurs and have various ideas about how to do that. There are people who think Either we don't have much hope or we don't have any business uh, of, of, of successful intervention in those um, regards. There's the whole question of China's behavior regionally. Uh, it's behaving, um, well, I would say the way the United States behaved as emerging power in its neighborhood uh, to some extent. But in any event, it, it, it's asserting um, uh, it's asserting more in the way of... Uh, of kind of hegemony there that then some people are comfortable with. Um, 
and in some cases, I think probably violating international law. I think not 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 abiding by the the international legal conception, for example, of where China's boundaries end in the ocean and so on. Um, what, what if you were Secretary of State or National Security Advisor? How would you sketch out what you think our approach to China should be? Yeah, um, in the current issue, I guess it's now the last issue of Foreign Affairs, I, I, I take up this issue in a piece called The Next Liberal Order, and I do uh, make the points that I've made earlier today, which are that it kind of a two-track approach of, of engaging uh, China on the big issues that we have convergent interests on, which start with climate change and financial stability, and and uh, and then increasingly I have seen, uh, you, you may recall that uh, 10 years, 12 years ago when I was first writing on liberal order in China, I was arguing that I was I was often uh, seen as kind of a panda hugger, as they they called me. I was, you know, the uh, uh, the liberal order uh, that 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 China wants more authority, but it doesn't want to fundamentally challenge the principles, and that the liberal order, as I said and has been quoted many times, is, is easy to join and hard to overturn. And China will eventually uh, uh, integrate, and there will be these kind of dynamics that will make them. Uh, converge more with us, not necessarily become a liberal democracy, but they will have more freedom in their society outside of the state sector and so forth and so on. I've, I've reluctantly come to see, particularly under President Xi, uh, as everybody else has seen, more authoritarianism creeping in and even kind of the kind of uh, neo-totalitarianism of, of, uh, of, uh, of monitoring and uh, uh, large data kind of con- social control. Uh, and so that I find that's frightening, deeply frightening. And so just to kind of tell you how I don't want to have to make a decision between engagement and, and um, pushback, um, uh, just, just say that when, when, it, when any of us wake up in the morning and we think about international politics, there tend to be two different kind of broad categories of worry. One is how can we, we keep the world from, uh, from unraveling into uh, to war? That's that's the security problems that realists worry about. The other problem is how do we protect our way of life? How do we, we, we make sure that our, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren can enjoy liberal democracy, rule of law, freedom of speech? So there's kind of these two different uh, things that we worry about when we think about how should we be uh, comporting ourselves, projecting power, making the United States the leading state in the system, do things we want it to do. So when we come to China, I think we need to do both of those things. We need to work with China. We should be engaging them. I would think the next administration would want to be, be trying to reestablish mill to mill, uh, 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 trying to prevent um, uh, uh, mistakes of, of, of miscalculation through protocols for dealing with, with uh, crises, uh, 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 so crisis diplomacy rules of the game. Uh, working together on things that we share about, we have a whole portfolio of these things that were that were there in the Obama administration that are ready to be put back. Um, but I also think, and this is where I I do come back to kind of the the coalition of democracies that we are stronger, and uh, in some sense, China will be almost relieved that it is facing not just an erratic America, but a set of countries that want to talk seriously about the rules and institutions of the global order for the next era and uh, do so on questions of cyber rules, uh, uh, biomedical, all the big issues, uh, artificial intelligence, all those things that are going to reshape the world, uh, but do so from a position of authority and strength that you can get when Europe, the United States, Japan, Korea, other countries are, 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 are speaking with one voice. So, and, and then my final point would be, we, we, uh, we often go back, uh, realists in particular, go back to George Kennan's long telegram, how do we deal with the Soviet Union? Uh, this is, of course, the, 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 the predicate was laid there for the, for the policy of containment. 
But most people don't read the end of that telegram. And at the end of that telegram, um, uh, uh, Kennan is saying, in the end, there's only so much you can do to manipulate uh, uh, Stalin and, and his choices and decisions, but we can uh, make sure that we do not simply replicate what they're doing, that we don't become their mirror, and that we have our own societies re reformed and reconfigured in a way that they're, they're healthy and uh, progressively oriented so that uh, we do not become kind of diseased tissue that, I think that's the language he used, that the communist movement can prey upon. So it's that kind of, the liberal democracies can learn from each other, can cooperate, can generate trust at a greater level among themselves. They don't always do this. And they're often outside of the liberal sphere engaging in crude neo-imperial behavior. All of that is true. But there is something there worth preserving and building on. And, it's, and you can do both those things. You can strengthen the liberal democratic world and you can engage China. They're not... We, they're not yeah. Uh, they're not things that you have to choose for, uh, on. So it's it's a kind of mixed mixed strategy would be my 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 advice to the next Secretary of State. Okay, um, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's nice to nurture liberal democracy wherever you can, including within in, in, within America. And, and and I think you know maybe a subtext of of some things I was saying earlier is that if we had done a better job abiding abiding by the rules externally. We would have a more robust liberal democracy internally. I do think uh, our series of interventions in the Middle East may have led to Donald Trump. But that aside, to get back to China, um, the uh, as you as you talked about, and, and by the way, I also was more optimistic than you were about the prospects for democratization in China. I thought that two things would be conducive to that one is economic engagement and the other is the kind of the nature of modern information technology well certainly the government has been better more clever than i anticipated about uh kind of overriding what are in some ways the naturally decentralizing tendencies of information technology so if there's going to be progress along this front th that's going to be a long game i mean i would say that i do think in some ways the uh, the technology has exerted a pluralizing force within China. Citizens get together and they organize by cell phone and protest, and the government pays attention to them. I mean, you know, and when they have a grievance about the environment or something, that does happen. But by and large, I share your disappointment. I overestimated the prospects for that kind of prospect, but uh, for that kind of uh, progress. But um, I, I want to, as you told the story, it, it did seem to me that you were continuing to intertwine the two questions of uh, optimism about China developing toward liberal democracy and optimism about China becoming a, a, a nation that abides by the international rules and buys into them. So you are, and, and I guess that's, that's one place we differ. I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not necessarily, I can well imagine a China that remains as authoritarian as it is now and abides... Uh, by the rules as much as we do and as much as we would like it to. I do think we ha it'll take a concerted effort on our part. You have to show them what you'll take and what you won't. Your yeah. trade deals, your trade deals have to demand things. Um, and, and, uh, maybe, uh, uh, the criteria for admissions to WTO, if we could go back in history, should have been stricter. But, but I do think you have to, um, it takes concerted effort on the part of America and its and its allies in this regard, who, as it happens, are are liberal democracies by and large. I agree with all that, uh, but I'm I'm not. I I just think I have to put on hold for now my hopes that China is going to become more democratic. Uh, and the fact that those hopes have to be put on hold does not necessarily make me pessimistic about bringing China into the community of nations more. Uh, the, what makes me pessimistic about that is the current governance of our country and the, and the currently dim prospects that we would get together with other countries who want to bring China into the community of nations and do a rational job of that. You know, that's, that's, yeah, I, my I, I think, um, 
I, I don't disagree with that. I, 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 I'm disappointed. I, I, I have to say that my own uh, theory, uh, uh, kind of liberal theory uh, of the 1990s, uh, did kind of overweight the the kind of dynamics of capitalism, uh, kind of la- the lapping tides of tap- capitalism and globalism eroding authoritarian social formations. Uh, I, I kind of uh, uh, bought into the you know the stakeholder thesis, and I still think there's there is a kind of um, uh, you know that the, the, there is a kind of long game here, and I think the long game of 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 keeping China engaged and keeping its society um, giving its giving the having the outside world configured in a way that inside of Chinese society, if there is uh, a move, our movements in the future for uh, opening up and uh, what we would call kind of liberal democratic. Uh, green shoots uh, of the future that those green shoots are are more likely to uh, be to, to appear and to flourish if there is a kind of functioning uh, rule based international order that has uh, liberal characteristics uh, of one kind or another um, if if the u s were to go to one extreme and and try to block and exclude uh, uh, China from everything, then that, of course, would be less likely. Uh, engaging it, but also in some sense, sharp, pointing out, uh, as I if, think I've suggested, where the lib- liberal, democratic, liber- liberal democratic values and, and cooperation uh, generates a kind of alternative uh, to, to China. So just to kind of wrap, wrap this up, um, if China is, as some people argue, attempting to put forward to the world a kind of modernity project as in the way that Habermas talks about that, about that as a kind of broad gauge view about how, uh, how uh, to advance society in the face of modernity uh, that is different from the liberal democratic model uh, of that or project of modernity. The, the Chinese mod- model is capitalism without democracy, capitalism without liberalism. I don't know whether that uh, that modernity project, the Chinese version, will succeed or not. I'm skeptical, but the but but it's it's it behooves us who have different values to make sure that our model is re reimagined, reformed, uh, re legitimated, and make it work for people. Uh, so so I think yeah. you agree with that, and I I think that yeah I'd say let's start out by making it work for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. you know, and and uh, that, that, that's why I tend to kind of focus on cleaning up our own backyard. I, I think the best thing we can do for liberal democracy is be a, an actual shining city on a hill. We are not one right now. No, no, it's 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 pathetic and it's sad actually because the the uh, the the there is a great deal of uh, of soft power of leadership uh, uh, that that. Uh, is that it, that could do great things? I, I really think uh, that 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 kind of soft tissue of the international system, uh, ex- uh, leading by example, uh, kind of uh, 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 being the first country to say, "Let's start a, a multinational project on on finding a cure for the virus." Um, uh, this right. kind of it's you know it's, 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 that, that, it's the just, pandemic was such an opportunity yeah for to to uh well to make the world a better place for one thing in addition to to setting an example and and being recognized as a leading nation and it's just amazing how opposite oh. our reaction i mean i need to tell you this so go ahead oh, I, 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 and that's for me that that what what what, the, the, what during the when the U.S. has performed at its highest level in, on the world stage in the last 200 years, it's done so with the idea that its own self-interest is tied to exporting ideas and frameworks for mutual cooperation, for non-zero, to coin a phrase, uh, uh, cooperation on a global st- stage. And uh, those ideas and frameworks for mutual gain – 
are the secret to what made the U.S. the most powerful and most influential country for 100 years. That has been, uh, that's been taken off the table, and uh, maybe it will never will be put back on. But, but it, that is something that we should remember when we're talking about the next era of, of global politics and how the U.S. can, what ideas should the U.S. be, be, be putting out there to, to, to be in the game of, of, of the, of helping to organize the next world order. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me just give you one, uh, you know, we've, we've talked a while and should probably bring it to a close, but why don't I, uh, give you one more chance to tell us something you would say, uh, to a president, if you were a national security advisor or secretary of state, about uh, policy, ideally in a specific, reasonably concrete realm. But this time, instead of me posing the question, why don't you just choose uh, something that you think would be uh, a, a, a kind of guidance that uh, that would be kind of central to your message? I would, I would say that. Um the that the U.S. Um, has a, 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 a long tradition of tying its own polity to uh, to building a, a world that that makes makes the world safe for for itself for, and for liberal dem democracy more generally, and that that. Uh, the, as I said before, uh, the 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 um, the U.S. has performed at its highest level, has been able to uh, make an impact on the world when it's seen as um, as creating circumstances that allow governments to make good on their promises to their own people. That at different moments, whether it's the Progressive Era or the New Deal Era or the Great Society Era. The U.S. and I would say liberal democracies more generally have been most impressive when they've tied their international uh, efforts, their foreign policy, to creating uh, institutions and infrastructure that allows their own governments to do things domestically that will make people better off. And the the, the starting point for Understanding that is, is to go back to the 1930s when the liberal democracies were really at their, at their kind of extinction moment, when what, what, six or seven or eight democracies were extant on the world's stage at that point. Some in Scandinavia, the, 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 the British Commonwealth countries, the U.S. Uh, and at that moment, there was a, a kind of vision of a, of a, of a, of, of a, of a liberal democratic world that would uh, provide institutions of cooperation that would allow regular people to have more stable, secure lives. Uh, we sometimes call this the era of embedded liberalism, that we will create international authorities and capacities so that what we're emerging as social democratic or welfare state democracies, uh, one of those achievements that I was mentioning earlier, that the kind of the, the, the transformation of industrial societies from the 19th century to the social democratic second half of the 20th century, we take that for granted. It happened, but it was very, very difficult, and it helped to have a set of countries that had things like uh, uh, the OECD and the IMF and the World Bank and, uh, and mechanisms for cooperation that allowed these states to, to, to to move forward in, in developing more just, equitable, progressive, secure societies. So, yes, as you suggested, Bob, the things begin at home. Uh, but also, when you go abroad and try to do international relations, you should always be thinking about how that can be brought home uh, at, to, for better purposes at home. And And I think that's what I would, I would not make a, a specific policy proposal uh, to, to a decision maker. I would sort of think that the most important thing for the next group of, of foreign policy operators after the election, if there is a new group, is to, is to, 
is to have kind of redevelop the software for running the program as opposed to run a particular uh, a, a particular run, but rather to reacquire the intellectual, political, and historical software for 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 doing uh, liberal internationalism, and that I think is what would be uh, be necessary to 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 see to see us lift ourselves out of this awful mess that we're in. Okay. Well, thank you. And look, you've got my vote for Secretary of State. The the uh, I, I I actually I mean seriously, although you and I have disagreed uh, about things in the course of this conversation. I'm willing to bet that uh, I would rather have you as Secretary of State than whoever winds up being Secretary of State, uh, in, in regardless of who wins the election. Um, that's uh, both a compliment to you and 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 uh, also well, some, yeah. something of a judgment of what is what is uh, of the foreign policy establishment uh, that that is likely to be drawn on by uh, uh, by a Democratic administration, but. Um, so uh, now, now, what would you recommend people read? The foreign affairs piece is that called the next liberal order, or the? It is, yes. And that's and and the subtitle is what the age of contagion demands more internationalism, not that's less. Right. right? It's that's that right. piece. So that's very pertinent. What what else should people read of yours? Um, in the way of either either article, journal articles, or existing books. Well, um, the, I, I think the. The big book is coming, uh, and I, I hope that that's read and discussed. Um, when is that? When is that coming? September in another month. Oh. It will. Be, oh, 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 yeah, oh. So, and there'll be uh, Zoom meetings, and uh, the Council on Foreign Relations will do a big event. There'll be lots mm-hmm. of, of, of opportunities to discuss that book. Um, uh, um, I'm, you know, doing some other work, uh, a collaborative work that's actually trying to look back at. Uh, at, at race in America and kind of alt America and liberal America and how these two different Americas, uh, most obviously two Americas during the, the civil war era, but have continued and, and why there's had, why there it's in, in some sense, uh, America on the world stage is continuously evincing both a kind of liberal face and a, a kind of alt America face. It's not just, as you were saying, it's not just Trump, but, yeah. uh, in terms of past work, um, uh, the book Liberal Leviathan is is kind of my uh, book on on how America did it. So when you heard me making these arguments about in world historical comparative for seventy years, this order it wasn't the global order, but it was a a kind of Western centered order, U.S. centered order was different than anything we've had before. Post the U.S. was the fir- first post imperial great power, and there were it was an order that was very different uh, and you need liberal international theory to understand it. That, that book gives you that, uh, that, that particular angle. I mean, it's funny. The order was built. It seems to be more than Western. I mean, the United Nations had uh, Soviet union and the security council as things played out, as the cold war played out, it became more of a, a Western enterprise. It did indeed. Um, you know, I, I one, one little tidbit to kind of just wrap this up. Um, um, the, people don't really remember the Hague Peace Conferences, uh, but the second one in, in 1907 was the closest thing you had to all states that were seen as being sovereign nation states were invited, including 12 states from the Americas, the republics of Latin America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Secretary of State during this period was Elihu Root, and he was helping to engineer getting these Latin American republics to to the Hague Conference, um, and he wrote a memo to the American delegates, and uh, I found it in a, in the you know in the as a dusty volume in the stacks. But what he said was was brilliant, really. What he and it was a kind of liberal vision that you at each go of international relations, you, you try to establish something pragmatically. You try to get an agreement, try to set up some, some uh, proto institution. You don't get everything you want, but then you come back and try again. And you, you kind of have a ratchet effect. He was arguing you, mm-hmm. you keep going and you keep working at it. And that things that were previously thought as impossible now look possible. 
it's not everything you want, but you now have a, a base that's a little higher to do mm-hmm. the next work. And that's, that's a quintessentially liberal idea. It's not a realist idea. It's not a radical left idea. It really is a kind of pragmatic reform. Uh, uh, w- Wilson used the term uh, corrigible. The world is corrigible. Uh, I use that term describing my son using the opposite, in, incorrigible. <laughs> but this is really the corrigible nature of the world. I, I, I think that's the liberal yeah. persuasion that – you you can make steps. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. Trump is definitely three steps back, but it's not uh, a ratification of the impossibility of moving forward the next time. And and there is a there will be a base, and we know that things can be done, even if some of those things that have been done unravel. So yeah. uh, I, I think uh, I think that uh, you know I, I I may have come off in this this dialogue as being a, kind of a little bit optimistic and kind of um, too much sunshine in a dark, in a period where we have dark skies. But I, I, I do think that we should preserve uh, and remember what we've done because uh, there will be new opportunities and we should be ready. No, I agree. I mean, I certainly, I, I think broadly speaking, you and I want to build uh the same kind of international order and, and, um, you know, I've, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I guess our, our differences are clear. I, I guess I now see that I could maybe describe myself as a, as a, as a, uh, a mm-hmm. liberal internationalist of a Westphalian sort. I, I have been using the term progressive realism, uh, to define the ideology I'd like to see, uh, prevail. It's a kind of a non, non judgmental, but very much uh, rule-based uh, order that, that does try to, certainly does try to encourage progress on human rights and democracy to the extent that it can, but but is perhaps uh, not as ambitious in that realm as... as yeah, I think that's a been. very creative difference we have. I, I, I see you, a, a kind of variant of your position, I, I see it in the uh, pluralistic English school tradition, Headley Bull. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, it is definitely a, a kind of... There's a there's a society of states, uh, but uh, but they are, uh, are 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 it's a pluralistic system in that that like you have suggested, uh, you don't render judgments uh, on what goes on inside. I again I have some problems with that in certain categories. I'm happy with that most of the time, but yeah. but uh, uh, I that's where some of the creative difference is. I, I'm in favor of non counterproductive judgments being passed. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a good way to okay. converge. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking the time, John. I really enjoyed this, and I, I and I think it was it was productive. And so maybe maybe we'll talk you into coming back. I'd love to. Okay. Love. Thank you, Bob. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah. Take care.